Here we explore the issue of echo cancellation making use of Kepstrom processing. This is a Simulink model, actually a DSP Speedster model, which builds on the very excellent little example that Ambardar gives to introduce us to Kepstrom processing in his book. And if you want to know more about Kepstra, then you should go to the classic books by Oppenheim and Schaefer. Well, everything to do with Kepstra in this model is over here in the right-hand part. We're going to come to that in a moment, but we'll start in the left-hand part of the model and create and build up the example Ambardar gives us. The signal is going to be a, a decaying exponential sort of signal, which we're going to get here uh, by repetitively impulsing an FIR filter. That will give us a signal which we're able to examine and furthermore to pipe off to other parts of the model to examine our uh, possibility of recovering the signal. Well, it's going to have to be recovered from the effect of an echo filter, this green one here, uh, which is defined by this B vector. And notice that there are uh, uh, 20, it's a 20 uh, sample delay and C, this value out here is going to be 0.8. So when we uh, look at the effect of that before and after on this scope. Here's the before signal and this is the after so we see the, the signal plus uh, an echo built onto it. That effect has got to be uh, undone and so if we look at the coefficients of this green filter and bring them around to this analyzer right here we can see that what's happening you can see here here's your one and here's your 80% strength echo out here after 20 samples. And this puts quite an oscillatory gain function down here with quite deep nulls, a comb filter. And we've got to undo this comb filtering uh, in order to get the original signal. Well, one approach to this deconvolution problem, it is, after all, convolution of this signal with this impulse response. And to do this in the frequency domain, one way is to divide out uh, by means of an inverse filter the effect of this gain right here. So if we take these coefficients which we've already had a look at, put them in as the A coefficients down here in this IR filter, and just put a 1 up there for the top, uh, then we've got now an all pole filter which is trying to counteract the effect of this all zero filter up here. And well, it can do this quite well because this is a minimum phase filter, therefore this is a stable inverse filter, and sure enough, we examine that down here, we can see the white traces right on top of the, of the yellow traces doing a good job, and we would expect that. If we go out here to the complex Kepstrom business, then we don't know what's going to happen. Let's just have a look, and we find out that it performs to the same degree of excellence. And so whatever it's doing, it's doing the same job as this uh, uh, inverse filter effect. If we change matters and put C equal 1, I'll broadcast this C equal 1 now, I'm very nervous because when I run this, uh, these zeros are now on the unit circle. Therefore, the inverse filter is going to have poles on the unit circle and this is a powder keg waiting to go bad. Uh, do I get away with it? I look out here and I see that yes, I do shakily get away with this, but I'm very, very nervous about this, particularly if I had bad numerical effects or different signal. Who knows what could happen right here? I'm asking for trouble with this poles on the unit circle. What about the Kepstrom activity? I go out here to have a look at it and I see that its scope is not doing so well this time. Uh, my white trace is not right on top of the yellow trace, so my reconstruction is not as good as I would hope for. Oh, why could this be? Well, let's see what the Kepstrom actually does. I go inside this block right here, and I see the essence of it, which are here in colored blocks. I come in from the time domain, FFT, take the logarithm, and then inverse FFT. So I'm coming in time, going out time, but meanwhile, logarithm. Well, logarithm of a product, of course, is the summation of the individual logarithms. That means that I have the possibility, instead of doing division down here with the inverse filter, I have the possibility of doing subtraction of the interfering Kepstrom contribution coming from this filter. 
So what's happening is I'm coming down, taking that filter on its own, which I happen to have private knowledge of, that's the essence of both these solutions here, and subtract that out. I then have to go through an inverse Kepstrom operation, which I can look at that as well. Uh, and uh, here's an FFT to take us from time back to frequency. And then I in, undo the uh, logarithm operation by an exponential comeback out in time domain. So I'm all the way out here uh, with a time domain signal and I'm a little bit unhappy with it, as we already said. Why? Well, one reason that's contributing to this is the logarithm of these zeros which are involved in the frequency domain. Uh, so does this, is this the end of the utility of our inverse Kepstrom? Not at all. Let me do something which Ambedar doesn't tell me do, to do. I'm going to, change, I'm going to make the C to be the reciprocal of that 0.8 value he gives us. Transmit this to uh, our model and see what happens. Well now I'm in big, big trouble because this is now a maximum phase filter and this therefore is a uh, definitely unstable filter and my inverse filter is going bazonkers as you can see out here. Uh, it's going absolutely crazy because I've really asked too much of the inverse filtering approach. What about this however? Uh, I go to examine what happens uh, in the case of this Kepstrom processing and I see that it's working perfectly. So what this shows is, in this example, for this situation, we can convert multiplication situations and therefore requiring division solutions into addition problems which require subtraction solutions and sometimes it works very well indeed.